So as you know, uh, just a few weeks ago, we started, a court, we started to do a study on the book of Ephesians. And as I started to nail this off, I realized, man, this, I could spend two years in Ephesians because every verse is full of truth. It's just, a, it's just blowing up with truth. And so this has been really tough for me because I've said, God, how can I narrow this down so we can do this in five weeks? So we, we have done that now. And um, it's basically how I'm going to break it down. The book of Ephesians is where we sit. Say where we sit. Okay. How we walk and how we stand. Those are the three things you can break Ephesians up. Now, we know that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, and we talked about that last week. So actually, the first week, we talked about holiness and blamelessness, that we were preordained to walk holy and blameless before him. But then there's two words in that verse, and it says, in love. And I talked about the importance of staying in love with Jesus, right? Because you can't be holy and you can't be blameless if you're not in love with Jesus. Because then you're doing things with the, with the wrong motive and, and you're not doing things birthed out of love. And God is what? God is, God is love. And so Paul was very clear that we have to remain in love with Jesus. Now the book of Ephesians was written to a, a, a church that was rich in spiritual gifts. They were, they were a Gentile church, but they were a faithful church. And they were more mature than maybe the Corinthians were when this was written. 30 years later, after Paul tells them, remember to stay in love, 30 years later, roughly, John is on the, the apostle is on the island of Patmos, and he says to them, hey, you're doing everything awesome, you're preaching, you know, you're faithful, you know, you know the word of God, you judge people with the word, you don't like sin, however, I have this one thing against you, you've left your first love. And so he said, basically, now you've just moved into a behavior modification program. You're trying to modify people to the kingdom without their heart being transformed. Amen? And so this is really important. And so how many know if the church of the Ephesians can backslide, we can too? So we have to guard our hearts. Okay, now, second week we talked about um, God's will is not a mystery. And I talked about the fact that we have to kill that sacred cow People walk around saying, well, God's ways are mysterious. Who can know the will of the Lord? That's all Old Testament. As new creatures in Christ, we have the spirit that lives in us who teaches us all things. And he reveals the things of the Father to us. Amen? Because he searches the deep things of God, and then he shows us what God's will is. So we don't have to walk around thinking God is mysterious. He wants to make himself known to us. Okay? We also talked about the fact that we're seated with him. So... Today, I want to go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 9. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me. If not, you can read it on the screen. And we're just going to summarize a few things here. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in once, uh, which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Now, I want you to realize what it says here. It says, in which you once walked, past tense. Okay, now it doesn't mean that as the church of Ephesus wasn't making mistakes and tripping into sin once in a while. When we talk about walking, we're talking about this is your way of life. You practice sin. I want to make that very clear because, you know, we can all fall. How many, how many agree? Though the righteous fall seven times, they'll stand again. So this is not about being perfect. It's not about... Uh, having no sin. It's about hating sin. And you have a hatred for sin, you begin to walk more and more with Christ. Okay, so moving on here. And so, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, okay, among whom also we also once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were by, by nature children of wrath, just as the others, but God who is rich in mercy... Because of what? His great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together, okay? With Christ, by grace you have been saved. I want you to see that. We've been saved by grace. And raised us up together and made us sit down together. See, this is not an option. I showed last week. I had Peter come up. And I, I sat him down on the chair, and, and I said, try to get up. And he tried to get up, and I would drive him down into the chair. I said, I'm making you sit here. So 
So you might not think you're worthy. You might not think that, uh, that God loves you, but the Bible is making, God is making you sit in that place of authority because you're in Christ. Amen. Whether you're aware of it or not, the Bible says people perish for lack of knowledge. If you don't know something's yours, you can walk in poverty your whole life, not knowing that God has a blessing for you. So he raised us up together and made us sit down together in heavenly places in Christ. Okay? And why did he do this? So we, he can show the riches of his grace in his kindness towards us. He wants to show the riches of his grace. So I want you to see this. You have a throne room in heaven. God is sitting on the throne. He raised Christ up and seated him at the right hand of the Father. He's seated beside him. We don't have our own throne up there, but we're in Christ. So I'm going to ask if, if you can bring me, Lori was going to bring me some objects. So if you want to grab this, we do a little illustration for you. All right. Um, but the reason why he raised us up and placed us in that place of authority is because he wants to show the riches of his grace towards us. Amen? And so we got some props here. Maybe just throw them here for a second. Awesome, great. Now, Peter, can you come help me? Where are you here? Come help me, brother. So, here you go. We'll put some water in that glass here. Maybe halfway. That's good. All right. <laughs> That's perfect. Okay, so here, here's, here's what happens here. We're going to put some stones in the water. Okay, so how many know here that uh, there's two objects together in the same glass? Okay? And if you, if you want to separate um, the rocks from the stones, you need a filter. So you grab that little filter there. Grab that little filter. And we're going to attempt to filter the stones out of the water. You ready? Sure, yeah, you can do that. Do that. It's, it's, it's safer. This one? Yeah, we'll do that. All right, so here we go. So in order to filter, to separate these two things, all you need is a filter. And I'm going to tell you why. Because they're, they're separate. They're different things. Okay? Now, we're going to do another example. Put that down. Okay? The Bible says when we get born again, the Spirit of God comes and dwells in our hearts by faith, right? That which is born of spirit is spirit. That which is born of flesh is flesh. So let's put some water in this glass, half of half the glass. Okay. Now, if you're liquid and the Holy Spirit is spirit and he's liquid, what happens when you mix the two of them together? It wants to come out here. Let's let's do something else here. Brought me an empty bottle. Okay, let's try this here. All right, the Holy Spirit is not green, by the way, but here we go. So now, what's happened is is there's there's a mixture, right? That which is spirit is spirit. So I don't care how hard you try. You can't filter it. And what happens is the Bible says, thank you, Peter. We'll just put that whole tray there for a second. The Bible says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You need to understand that because you say, well, what, isn't it my, there's two spirits in here. So it's also the temple of my spirit. That's true. But what happens is when the spirit comes in with your spirit, there's, there's a mixture. So you become a new creature in Christ. See, there, were, there, was, there was animals before, and there was human spirits, but now there's a new type of spirit. It's a spirit that's born of God. And so because you're one with Christ's spirit, when he's, he's seated in a place of authority in heaven, you're not actually seated in heaven yet, but your authority is there because your spirit is connected with Jesus, because you have a soul tie with Jesus. Isn't that good? And you cannot separate the Holy Spirit from your spirit because the two become one. Do you guys see that? And so the Bible says that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. 
Our spirit is connected with his spirit because we're born of God. All right? And I want to say this, that the throne room of God is a place of grace. The Bible says we're seated with him for the purpose that his grace can be known to the world. And Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, Let us therefore come timidly, no, come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain what mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is so important because, you know what, you're going to slip up, you're going to fall, and when you do, you're going through life, and all of a sudden you slip up and you fall. The voice is going to come immediately and say, you're not worthy. You've sinned too much. God's not going to forgive you. You've committed the unpardonable sin. You're going to hear all these voices. You might have feelings come up that say, I'm not worthy, or my parents always said I was no good for nothing. Maybe God feels that. And because the enemy doesn't want you to be a righteous person, to stand seven times and go back to battle. And, and, and there's this, this thing where I, I can't boldly go to the throne of grace. That's God's holy, sacred place. I can't go there. I want to tell you something you can. You want to know why? Because you have a throne in heaven. You're seated in the place of grace with the Father in Christ. That's why, because we're joint heirs with Christ, we, ha we, are, we have royal blood in our veins. We're able to go boldly before the throne room of grace and obtain mercy in time of need. Why? Because we're joint heirs with Christ. And I've learned over the years that when I fall, I get up immediately and I say, God, I'm coming. I need your grace. I talked last week about grace. Grace means unmerited favor. That's out of the Hebrew. And if you look in the Greek, it actually speaks of God's divine influence upon my heart. And I need my heart to be influenced by the grace of God continually. And I need you, God, because I'm a pilgrim in progress. And God, I'm going to mess up, but you know what? I'm going to stand up and I'm going to go again because you have a purpose and a destiny for me. Don't ever let the enemy get you to think that you're not worthy or you can't go before God. The Bible says come boldly into the throne room of grace and receive mercy in your time of need. And the problem is a lot of Christians feel like, I'll come to God when I got my crap figured out. I'm dealing with issues. You know, I'm, I, I'm still addicted to cigarettes. You know, I'm still, you know, falling in this area. So I'll just wait till I get it all figured out and then God will, it doesn't work that way. You got to come boldly to the throne room of grace and say, God, I need you. I need, it's your divine influence upon my heart. Come and change me. Come and touch me. Come and transform me. And in that place of grace flows the miracle that will deliver you from sin. Amen? And here's how it works. The atmosphere of heaven. Did you know there's an atmosphere in heaven? The atmosphere of heaven, the throne room, is grace and mercy. That's, that's the atmosphere of heaven. So what we have here is we have our natural atmosphere. We live down here. Then there's the second heavens. It's another dimension. Don't think of layers. But there's a second dimension, which is where the prince of the power of the air operates. It's called the second heaven. That's where all the demonic attacks come against us. But then there's the third heaven, and that's the throne room of God. That's what it is. And the Bible says that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. So I don't care if you feel like a loser and you say, listen, I'm just, I'm nothing. I'm, the Bible says we're all part of his body. And you can say, but I feel like I'm the little toe. Actually, I feel like I'm the wart, the planter's wart, on the bottom of the little toe. And I would say this, you still have your foot over the enemy's head because of what Jesus accomplished at Calvary. Amen? You have to begin to do warfare from a place of authority. From a pla you have to recognize you're not fighting everything that's above you. You're not shadow boxing the enemy, but you're from a place of authority, and you're, you're above what the enemy is trying to do in your life. And that's the key to Ephesians, is understanding that you're a princess, you're a prince, you're a joint heir with Christ. And God wants you to walk in that authority. All right? And so if we're seated in this place of grace, we need to walk in grace. Unmerited favor. We have to share the love of God. Grace and mercy influence the culture of heaven. And, you know... Atmosphere will always produce culture. How many know that? 
What is culture? Culture is the way we do things here. And um, we need to recognize that grace is, is flowing from the throne room. Every time you go into the throne room of grace and obtain mercy in time of need, you have to come, freely receive, freely give it away. And what we do is we go back. God has just forgiven us of something, and we feel that burden lift. How many know what I'm talking about? You go to prayer, you just feel like dirty, and you ask God to forgive, and you feel the burden lift. You feel like, yeah, he, you know, love's never on the table for discussion, but you feel that sin is removed. And then you go out, and somebody says, hey, would you forgive me? No, I'm not going to forgive you. You might not say it, but in your heart, you're just like, They've had their chance. Are, are we taking the culture of heaven like it is in heaven? Let your will be done on earth. Are we taking grace and mercy and we giving it away? Are we letting it flow? Because the more we let it flow, the more it will grow in our spirits. Amen? God is good. I should have wrote a Dr. Seuss novel. I think. But I didn't. I, anyway, I only rhyme under the anointing, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> You know, when we're talking through the book of Ephesians as we're moving through, we need to understand the rest of chapter 2. It covers two things, which I'm just going to skim over. That is that we're, we're brought into the kingdom of God, and we become benefactors of the covenants of promise that were only accessible to the Jews. So we need to pray for Jerusalem. We need to pray for the Jewish people, the one, especially the ones that have rejected the Messiah. We need to pray that their eyes be open. Because we become benefactors of the blessings of Abraham that now become ours. And finally, because of Christ, both Jews and Gentiles have access by the same Holy Spirit to the Father. Okay, let's go to verse, verse, uh, verse 19. It says here, does anyone find it hot in here or is it just me? Okay, let's, all right. Thank you, Chris. All right. We, we will get it cooled down. Okay, verse 19 says, uh, we're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. Okay, no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the house of God. Do you know, when you become a citizen, guess what? You have rights. And I remember when my, I married my beautiful wife from Sweden. We've been married now for 18 years. And so I had to sponsor her in to the country. When I married her, so she had to come in as a sponsor. And she'd become a, what we call a landed immigrant. And as a landed immigrant in Canada, you have, uh, you know, you have the, the right to work and you have the right uh, to, uh, you know, to do everything like a, like a citizen can, but you cannot vote. And every time you go to the country and you have to go through customs, it's a pain in the rear end because I would literally, every time we go through the states, she would have to go out and they would fingerprint her and they're like, why have we been married for 10 years and you're still just the land? And it was, and so it, it was weird. So I said, Camilla, let's, let's just go and get your citizenship. So she, she called Ottawa and we got the citizenship package. And what we realized very quickly um, was that she had to write a test. And so she had to study a book on the culture and the Canadian history. She had to study geography. How many have done that? Have you become a, a okay, you remember doing that? So you have to study all of that and then you have to write a test. And I guarantee that probably most of us, if we didn't study it, we would probably flunk it, okay? Because they were like asking me the names of all the prime ministers. I'm like, I don't know, you know? I can tell you the presidents of the states. But anyway, so I'm sitting there, try, you have to remember this. You got to know your geography and all. So she has to write a test. In order to get a clear picture of the kingdom, we have to study the word of God. We have to know the culture of the kingdom. We need to understand the Jew, we need to understand both new and old because the Old Testament is the new, is the new concealed. And as you begin to study the Old Testament, you begin to see Jesus popping up everywhere. And it brings revelation to you. Amen. Amen? So I just wanted to put that plug in there. That we study the Word of God. Okay? Um, so I just want to talk about a couple more things here. In Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verse 10. Okay? Um, well, we'll start in verse 8. To me who is the least of the saints, this grace was given, and I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what, uh, what is the fellowship of the mystery which was from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the church, to the principalities and the powers in heaven. Now, you know what the word manifold means? The word manifold actually means, okay, um, 
I'm way off my notes here, so I'm going to see. It actually, it, it, it speaks of many colored, many sides, many aspects. And my wife explains it very well. She was doing a teaching at the New Life Girls Home, and she said, you know, it's, God is like a diamond. Uh, and, and every time you turn the diamond, you see another aspect of the beauty of God. You see another cut. You see another revelation of the beauty of God. Amen? Amen. And that's what God is like. We continue to grow. We continue to see the manifold wisdom of God. And it's multicolored and it's multifaceted. And when you begin to understand that, you stop being critical. I said that a few weeks ago I shared, I was with the pastor who's a good friend of mine. We were chatting and he said, Travis, he said, you know what? He said, I'm more and more convinced that God needs many different types of churches because there's many different types of people. And we need to stop criticizing and judging one another and start focusing on what we agree on, which is Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. All of the other stuff is just secondary. We can learn to love one another without being critical because we believe things a little bit differently. Like, who gives a rip? If we could stand in agreement on the things we agree on, we'd be a force to be reckoned with. Amen? Amen? And so I think that's a word for us today. Now, I want to go to, um, I'm way off these anyway, so wait, throw those out. <laughs> so Paul, Paul, Paul cares for the Corinthian church. He's explaining to them, or not the Corinthians, the Ephesians church. He's explaining, this is where you're seated. You're seated in a place of authority. I want you to say that with me. I'm seated in a place of authority. Okay, now, as he's, he's ministering to them in this letter, look what he says here uh, in chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. He, he wants um, us to be strengthened with might in our spirit, in our inner man. Why is that? Okay? And I hope you can follow me, Gabe, because I just threw my notes out. Okay. So, which probably wasn't a good idea. But let's flip over to um, chapter 4, verse 17. Okay? Ephesians 4, verse 17. Okay? This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. Okay? having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, which is sin, to, to work all uncleanness with greediness. greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Christ. Verse 22, that you put off... Concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. We're supposed to put off our old way of acting. Put it off. Have nothing to do with it. Look what it says here. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Put off that which was old and put on the new man. Okay? It's kind of like Iron Man, right? You guys know Iron Man? Right? What's, the name? What's his name again? Uh, bef- yeah, Tony Stark. Thank you, because it slipped my mind. Tony Stark, right? He's not much of a dude. He's not, he, he's not like the other Avengers, right? But as soon as he gets in that suit, he becomes superhuman because he puts on the Iron Man suit. And it's the same thing with Christ. you got to put on Christ. You have to make a choice. Listen, I'm going to dwell in that place of grace. I'm going to go to the throne room of God. I'm going to draw on God's unmerited favor. I'm going to draw on, on, on that grace that I need, that influence. On my, I need to draw from my relationship. And when you draw from your relationship in God, it's like you're putting on this armor suit, and it makes you invincible. And Paul is not saying, you got to stop trying to do those things. You need to stop hanging around those people. You need to stop. No, he's saying, put on Christ. Put on your suit of armor. Because that thing was created, the Bible says, verse 24, you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So there's a suit of armor that you can put on that was already created by God, and it's a holy suit. And it defends you from wickedness. And it defends you 
and to keep your mind safe. We're going to talk about the armor of God in the next few weeks. Verse 25, therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give place to the devil. You, got, you follow me okay? Good job. Verse 28. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. I don't know what it is. I, I just find in Christendom now, it's almost like, it's, a, it's kind of like this fad thing where Christians like throw out a word here or there just to get, you know, and it's an unpure word. It's like, no, no, don't. It, put it off. That's not part of who you are. Don't try to fit in or be cool and use words that are inappropriate. No. Is your word producing grace to the hearer or is it, is it just, are you just blending in? Watch what comes out of your mouth. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edifying and building people up. And, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do you know what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit? I, I'm convinced that 90% of the church thinks it means you're, shut, you're shutting the worship service down too fast. That's the only time I ever hear, Pastor, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. We should have kept worshiping. Um, why don't you, you know, there's... I'll tell you what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit. We can read a whole list here. It doesn't say anything about worship. Amen? Amen. Can you do that? Yes, but I'm, that's not the main thing, okay? Verse 30, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of re redemption. Let all bitterness, yeah. say bitterness, bitterness. Wrath, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, put it away from you quickly. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. We have to, as a church, guys, we have to be tender-hearted. We have to love one another. We have to be patient. Yes, I don't care if your brother in the Lord keeps sinning and falling. Just keep loving him. I'm serious. Love him. You can say, listen, what you're doing is, is wrong. Look what the Bible says. But I love you, and I, I want you to... You can't... You sinner. You can't. You can't. Have patience. Pray for them. You know what I mean? All that, that energy you put into to, to talking about the sin they're in. Why don't you put, get on your knees and talk to God about visiting them? Amen? God, would you, would you open their eyes that they might know their inheritance? May they know what it is to put on Christ, to put on Iron Man suit. Amen? They need to know, because you know it, but maybe they don't know it. So you need to pray for that revelation. Amen? And so, going back to the prayer, I know this is a long and there's so much. Can I keep going for a few more minutes? Okay. Ephesians chapter 3. Go, here we go. We're going to move on here. For this reason I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family on earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. God wants to touch you and put his power in you so that you're able to overcome sin and it's no longer a temptation for you. Some of the struggles that you have, you're trying not to sin anymore. What you need to do is you need to be empowered with the spirit by might so that you don't want it anymore. And there's a difference. You can have that. But let's go to the next thing that he prays. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, okay, we talked about this the first week, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, what is the length, what is the depth, and then the fourth dimension, which we don't understand, it's above our knowledge, and then the height, four dimensions. And he even tells us in the next verse. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, it's the fourth dimension, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Do you want to know what it's like to be full with all the fullness of God? Get rooted and grounded in God's love. Spend time in the throne room of grace. Spend time, let the culture of heaven, of grace, touch your life, and then go give it away to somebody else. Let grace and mercy flow out of your life. Begin to love unconditionally. Begin, if you see people in sin, pray your heart out. 
for them. Just begin to pray for them. Begin to, to minister to them. Begin and, and let love flow out of you. Now, why did Paul tell them that I'm praying that you be rooted in the love of God? Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 1, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. My Bible tells me that God is love. And if I'm going to imitate God, and that's, that's our mission statement here, that we model Jesus and share his love. So if I'm going to be an imitator of Jesus as a dear child, right, then I need to know the love of God. I need to be rooted and planted in the love. I have to know God. I have to know how deep your love is, how wide your love is, how high your love. I need to know these things. Why? Because I want to imitate you. I don't want to just be about behavior modification, helping people live better lives. They can go to, you know, they can go to Tony Robbins for that. I want to help them find Jesus and be sanctified. Be transformed by the renewing of their mind. I want to help them put on Christ and become a superhero and be able to overcome the works of the devil. Verse 2, it says here, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. When we walk in love towards one another, um, it, it, it's a sweet-smelling aroma. In the nostrils of God. It really is. When you love people unconditionally, despite where they're at, and just say, I love you because Christ died for you. You know, you need, you know, I'm not better than you. I'm better off because I've accepted the cross. And if you accept the cross, you'll be in a better place. You'll be able to put on Christ. You'll be able to go to the throne room of grace and obtain mercy. You'll have a place on a throne like I do. You're royal. just like I, You just have to accept Christ. The gospel becomes empowering. The gospel becomes truth. Amen? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Amen? What is the condemnation? This is the condemnation that men love darkness rather than light and refuse to come to the light. So if you come with the culture of heaven, they say, what is that? You say, this is the culture of heaven. I want it. But if you come waving your finger and bringing condemnation, they already know that because they got themselves to do that. Amen? Walk in love as dear children. Amen? Now, here's, we're going to move here a little bit more. For this you know, that no, we're going to go from the nice fuzzy message to the, the hard thing. Okay, you guys ready for that? For this you know that no fornicator, okay, sexual sin, unclean person or a covetous man, someone who wants um, to, what other, other people have, okay, um, who is an idolater, who has, they don't have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Because if you want something that belongs, you covet somebody else's stuff. Is that love? Is that being rooted? In, is that flowing out of love? If you want to use somebody's body for your sexual pleasure, is that, is that love or is that lust? Right? God wants us... <laughs> Good job. Um, God wants us to, he wants us to love. He wants us to, to serve. He wants us to give. And so that's why if you operate, if you walk with that way of life, the Bible says you'll have no inheritance in the kingdom. And verse 6 says, let no one deceive you with empty words. There's a lot of preachers today that will get and tell you, it's okay. Grace is enough. You can live however you want. The Bible says here, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, I want to stop here for a second because I want you to see this. The first thing I said, week number one, when you study the Bible, look for past tense, present tense, or future tense. That's the only way you can study it. Now, there are preachers out there that say that God's anger and wrath was poured out on Jesus Christ, and he's no longer angry. This tells me the wrath of God comes upon. Is that present tense? The sons of disobedience. So if, if, if you're a Christian and you, once in a while you stumble and you fall into sin, you get up again, you repent, and you move on. But if you have this attitude that I belong to Jesus, I'm just going to live like the devil, and you're going to fornicate, 
and you're going to lust, and you're going to covet, and you have no conviction, there's no inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for you. Amen. That's what the Bible says. It actually says that the judgment of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Amen? Therefore, don't be partakers with them. I can't finish that. That's kind of dark, but it, it's true. All right? And I want to say this in studying, studying the judgment of God, because how many know God will judge us as well? Judgment begins with the house of God. Every time judgment comes from the Lord, actually in Corinthians it's talking about the Lord's Supper. Do, do we have the verse there, Corinthians? But he said, some of you have been eating and drinking, partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, not discerning the body of Christ. So who is the body of Christ? The church. For this reason, many are sick and weak among you, and some have died. And then it goes to say, judge yourself so that God does not have to judge you so that you don't become partakers with the world. It's very, very clear. Every time God deals with judgment within the church, and study the word to see this, it has to do with when we do not love one another and when we condemn one another. God is so, he wants us to protect his body. We are his body. We need to protect one another. We need to love one another. We have to encourage one another. We, with all gentleness and meekness, we have to lift one another up. As soon as we begin judging, as begin as we get hard towards people, you open yourself up for judgment. Wow. So I'm going to end this right now because I threw my notes away. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we would be, as Paul prayed, rooted and grounded in the love of God. Everything we do is because we love you, and we do it with that motive. God, may we take from grace, and can we impart it to people around us, that we can help them see truth. We can help them to understand that they need to put on Christ. They have to arise from their sleep. Their eyes need to be open, God. Help us to walk that walk and give it away. In Jesus' name.